Şimdi benim sorum e, özellikle se, Sayın Sengup da ya, idi ama e, Jody de bazı e, önermeler yaparak o da dahil olmuş oldu benim soruma. E, yalnız önce bir açıklama yapma zorundayım ki e, o geçişleri anlatırsam eğer daha açıklayıcı olabilir sorum. Şimdi öncelikle Sengup TV ve Jody'e çok teşekkür ediyorum. Yani diğer konuşmayacağı da tabii ama e, buradaki e, çok yeni şeyler söylendi. Ama tabii bunlar aslında çok da yeni değil. Onu da söylemekte fayda var. İşte tarihsel olarak baktığımızda İbnül Arabi, eski Mısır öğretileri, eski Hint destanları ve öğretileri ve ezoteriğin içinde bu önerilerin bir çoğunun olduğunu biliyoruz. Ha, bunlar tabii geliştiriliyor ve katkılarla. Ee, şimdi eski batıda da var mesela kaos teorisi. Kaos dediğimiz zaman hep bir korkuyla <gülüyor> yaklaşılıyor. İşte kaosta ne yapılır? Ufuk yok mudur? Yahut da yol alınamaz mı diye. Halbuki tabii ki bunlar da artık konuşuluyor. İşte e, kaosta karmaşıklık içinde yol alma. Yani Lenin, e, madem Lenin'den <gülüyor> örnek verdi hem Jody hem de Sengup'ta Lenin'in dediği şu diyor ki evet yani bir karmaşıklık ortamıdır diyor devrim ama diyor binlerce etken vardır evet diyor ama bunun içinde yol alınabilir diyor bütün bu etkenler düşünülerek kısa erimli programlar yapılabilir diyor diye hatırlıyorum eğer yanlış hatırlamıyorsam şimdi bu çerçevelenmiş toplumlarda e, kurallı toplumlar falan diyebiliriz Tabi burada hep bütün doğudan batıya nereye gidersek gidelim bir çerçeve koymak isteyenler var. Bu da ufuk açısından başka bir sorunu gündeme getiriyor. Çünkü çerçeve tehlikeli bir şey. Yani medeniyetin önünde bir engelle, statik bir durum. Stabilize ediyor. Dolayısıyla bir renklilik, özgürlük sağlamıyor. Benim bakış açım böyle. Şimdi burada e, Deloğuz'da mesela göçebe toplumlar üzerine yersizlik, yusuzluk tezlerini sundu. E, herkes buna katkı yapıyor. Şimdi bu noktada tabii e, simülasyon ihtimallerini e, bu kaos ve karmaşıklık yok ediyor. Bir, bir nevi özgürleştirme diye de okuyabiliriz karmaşıklığı. Bu çok önemli. Şimdi bunun üzerine işte bu e, bütün bu çabalar bütünleşebilir. Yani paralellikler vardır. Onun için bu kaos hususunda yani karmaşıklık diyelim. Kaos biraz daha şey. Karmaşıklık e, fraktal bir e, biçimde ele alınabilirse yani hacmi aynı tutup da içini zenginleştirerek bir sürü e, imkanlar tanır, özgürlükler tanır bize. O bakımdan e, Sengupta'ya o soruyu soruyorum. Yani kaos teorisiyle Anlattıkları konusunda paralelikler nedir? Teşekkür ederim. I'll just, um, I'll just, whoops, sorry. My microphone doesn't work. I'll just very quickly synthesize the question. In, in, in essence, the question is to Shuda Sengupta, what parallels can be drawn in your talk with um, with the situation and the chaos that you have been describing. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the wealth of your comments and the plenitude of your question. Um, you know, if, you're, if you look at what pilots do when they fly, the most important thing when a pilot flies is to try and keep his wings level on the horizontal plane. And the way that that's done, if your instruments fail, as sometimes they do, is to keep sight of the horizon. If you see the horizon line, you know that your airplane has got its wings on, on the horizontal plane, which means you're on course somewhere. Losing your horizon as a pilot means you're in what is called a spiraling dive. Um, which means your coordinates of, of, the, of the actual, of the, of the physical universe uh, have been disturbed. Now, it is also true that the horizon is an actually arbitrary line that we conceive for ourselves. 
In reality, there is no such thing as a horizon because we live on a spherical planet, because we cannot perceive the sphericality of our planet in, in ordinary experience. The limits of our visual field are visible to us as a horizon. And so I think that the, that the relationship between determinacy and indeterminacy, between chaos and agency, um, are actually something of this uh, something akin or parallel, as you, as you say, to the relationship between the actual contingency and the chaotic nature of the universe, and our ability or our desire, uh, not our drive, to, to, to make a space for human agency in action. Which means to say that in order to navigate this, uh, this floating ball in space and its chaotic but regular movements, we need to kind of construct our horizon lines. And for me, um, the idea of a communist horizon is, is somewhat of in the nature of a horizon line. The, the pilot never actually lands at the horizon. The pilot lands in Istanbul or in uh, or in Athens, or in New Delhi, or in New York, which is never the horizon. But in order for him or her to be able to fly and land, it is absolutely necessary that there is a horizon in their mind. Even if it does not, as I maintained, actually exist. It's taking advantage of the limitations of our perception, intersecting with the optical nature of the physical world that we construct horizons. For me, that's parallel to the way we fly through history. I don't know if that answers your question. And yes, I am very grateful to you for your invocation of, let's say, Ibn Arabi. Um, there are many parallels that we can look for and excavate in the different histories that we inherit uh, for such horizon lines. There's a question here in the front. Here you go. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I have uh, two remarks or questions. Uh, maybe I can uh, uh, merge them uh, for Jody Dean. Uh, one of them was just something I was thinking of. Of course, you were referring in the early part of your lecture to uh, to this uh, to. Uh, the Tea Party movement in, in the United States, that this kind of radical, uh, extreme, anti-left uh, movement. But the interesting thing is, isn't it, one of the interesting things of the Tea Party is that it takes uh, some of the, the, the, uh, the techniques or methods, you could say, of the left-wing radicals and then uses them uh, for a right-wing agenda. And um, for example, and even this calling everyone, everything that you don't agree with a communist, also that has uh, an echo in uh, left-wing uh, behavior by calling everybody that you don't agree with a fascist or a Nazi. Marriage could be fascist, uh, you, you know, having a job could be fascist, etc. Et uh, so, uh, I think that, that would uh, make your story your, uh, more complex and maybe more paradoxical and therefore more, uh, more interesting because I think it is very interesting how uh, it happens many times in, in history uh, uh, that um, things, tools, be, uh, modes, tropes, developed in one poli political, near one political pole, then get uh, displaced uh, to, to the other political pole, and sometimes to even more effect. Uh, uh, that, that's one thing. The other thing, uh, I thought it's interesting that you, uh, you, you, you re, uh, um, how do you say, you try to uh, uh, make a case for uh, the communist horizon, that communism is a real horizon, a model that is actually uh, 
it, that is so um, convincing that it might even be threatening for uh, capitalism. But the interesting thing is in setting off these two old arch enemies is that you're not entirely fair uh, as the, of course, objective referee that you are. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, because capitalism is constantly, uh, how do you say, uh, qualified as being awful on the basis of what it has done and what it has produced and the kind of cruelty and inequality and disaster and ugliness and, and destruction that it has wrought. So what it's, it's judged on the basis of what it did. No, what it's doing. What, what it's, it's doing. doing okay, now. okay. What, on, on the basis of its effect on the world. Communism, however, you set off as a model for capitalism on the basis of what it should be or of what it could be. So as a model, as something existing in a theoretical, uh, in, in, on planet theory. While capitalism is being treated on what it has done on planet Earth. So it, with that, and then I have to say, again, uh, being subjective, not entirely objective, uh, that made me feel uneasy about the mocking, sneering tone you used vis-a-vis -vis democracy, participation. Of course these things have, have their problems, but that's the whole point. But and of course we should be very critical about them and of, well, why not mock them and why not sneer at them? But to sneer at them from a position that is so, um, how do you say, theoretical, okay. makes it very, ma makes it for me difficult to swallow. Sorry for taking too much of your time. Um, I'm glad you were uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, is that, I don't think that's a real, I'm, I mean, look, do you want me, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to say, oh, well, you know, really, I don't mean it. Right? That's actually not very helpful to say, for me to say, oh, you know, to sort of back down or say, oh, well, you know, it's just theoretical. I actually don't even think that's correct as a description of my lecture because I grounded it in network discussions and network practices now. I grounded it in actual activities of people in communicative capitalism. So I don't think it's just theory world. I think it's actual existing practices of folks in a new media world. That's the part about the democracy, but the part where I, where, where I mocked that you were in theory world was about your uh, promotion of the communist horizon. That's the positive part, in yeah. my view. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's a line. Can I just add? <coughs> Can I just ask that um, the next person who poses a question would please introduce themselves and um, for all of the panelists to speak into the microphone for um, the people up in the balcony because I know that they have difficulty hearing. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Simon Sheik. Um, I'm just wondering uh, about the relationship between uh, the visible and the invisible in terms of let's say a horizon as ideology or as an ideological image, especially if it is not real, especially if it's only a fictitious image, uh, uh, phenomenologically. Uh, because what I'm interested in is in if we can say that the horizon is something that not only represents but also depresents in so reality. Represents? represents, not only represents, but by every representation, and this is also, I think, has to do with art, depresents another possibility, another reality. And, and in relation to this comment, I, would, I wonder if, in a way, all of you on the panel could comment on what uh, Boris said, Boris Budin said so excellently at the end of yesterday, if there is a communist horizon, whether it's actual 
uh, or whether it's, it's uh, imaginary, whether it's uh, uh, temporarily possible as a future or only temporarily possible as past, these, disregarding those issues, can we say that there is a fascist horizon or is there, is there a fascist horizon, and if there, or is there only a fascist anti-horizon? Yeah, I don't know what anti-horizon would mean. Um, I, um, is there a fascist horizon? The, the weird thing about that kind of question is, even the, it, is that the folks that, um, I would want to identify as fascists, let's say the Tea Party people. Um, it's not clear, or no, it's not, they would not want to now raise the you know, banner of fascism, right? So to that extent, they want to distance themselves from it rather than claim that. Um, does that make them shaped by fascism as a historical force? I think so, but it makes them shaped, I would say, in different ways than the left is shaped. So I think that they're shaped in, in a way that they continue to repeat it. But in my, the, the way I think about it is, is, it seems much more, and this is what Boris said yesterday, which I thought was very, very good, it seems much more that, to me that they're shaped from um, the loss of communism, right? Communism re requires, the, I mean, I'm sorry, fascism has required the elimination of communism. Right? So hist um, historical, com um, it eliminated communism historically um, in Germany, right, through the um, in, you know, murder and imprisonment of communists. And in the US, I would say that the elimination of communism as um, a name that people claim um, in any kind of significant way, it has made possible the hideous kinds of politics that we see on the far right. So to that extent, I think that, they are, that it would, the horizon I would describe would be one of the shape that they're, take, that st they're still taking by the loss of communism, and that that enables a kind of fascism. So I wouldn't call that anti-horizon. Um, I would just say that, there's a, that the loss of communism has an effect. It has a shape that is actual in our political setting. Shuda, you wanted to reply? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question, Simon. I'm, I am not prepared to, um, to position the horizon in the future. I think the horizon is a spatial metaphor, not a temporal metaphor. Uh, the horizon, in that sense, provides us with an image, as you said, of how we might fly, right? It doesn't actually give us a, a date or a calendar. And I think that the problem with, uh, with communists is that they always consider the revolution as something that you, that you position in the future. Um, I think the time of revolution is the now. And I'm making a distinction between now and the now. There is always a present, in which, which, which means that the idea of communism today is quite different from what communism would have meant in 1917 or in 1945. It may also be quite similar to what communism might have meant in 1848, right? And different at the same time. Um, I am not prepared, like Jody, to, um, to, to jettison uh, speaking of democracy, because for me, speaking of communism is speaking of democracy, and speaking of democracy is speaking of communism, uh, because of the invocation of the sovereignty of what it, con what, what it means to be uh, a person. But that preparation is something that we do. I mean, in, in, uh, I'm sure that some of you here are familiar with the idea of zikr, of, of, of remembering and um, and of practice, I see the, the idea, the, I see the reality of communism as something that everyone can practice daily now. It's in claiming for ourselves an expanding, um, expanding, uh, in, in expanding our claim on time, on, on the time of our lives, um, and in creating uh, structures of abundance where this, this bargain between necessity and freedom that we have to live in with capitalism can be challenged 
on a daily basis. So for me, a communist revolution, and that is why this whole rhetoric of stages from um, you know, capitalism to socialism to communism is, is such a dubious business. I mean, I've always felt that the socialist idea was something we can abandon in order to claim the, the reality of communism as a present force, as a perpetually present force, where I would agree with you. Uh, in architecture, you think about uh, horizon also. In, in spatial uh, terms, I think uh, uh, yesterday we talked about various definitions of horizon, uh, even from uh, Heidegger. I think Peter brought uh, those. Up. I suppose the, the one that was more influential in architecture was the idea that the horizon uh, defines the limit of uh, uh, what can be seen. Uh, and in many ways this is understood in architecture as uh, organizing the visual uh, uh, field into an interior, right? And, um, and, and uh, other uh, uh, definitions of horizon and ideas of horizon that uh, have been influential even for myself will be the idea of Nietzsche, that uh, uh, the, the, a man with a horizon falls six and, and Cannot, uh, cannot function basically, even um, physically, right? So it is very much part of the project of modernity in architecture, uh, the question of the framing of the horizon. In fact, uh, this is a, a kind of a persistent idea from the beginning of the, of the century, and we talked with Fulia in Amsterdam about whether I should talk about this instead of about <laughs> that, because, I mean, in fact, you can engage with the horizon in so many ways, but from Frank Wright, let's say, uh, to Miss Van der Rohe, to the whole uh, beginning of modernity, is this idea that uh, the horizon uh, defines uh, an interior, right? Uh, so in, in that sense, and, and going back to, to what was being said before, then I will, I will stay with the idea of, uh, of I mean, I, like, I love very much your idea of the, I mean, your, your image of the, of the flying, because it's, that's precisely, I think, what modern architecture tries uh, to do uh, during this, uh, this, this period. Frame, and it's incredibly debate, actually, very, very strong and polemical debate, um, between, let's say, Le Corbusier and, and Perret. Perret, which was very progressive, using concrete, uh, embracing new technologies of construction, but he's still subscribing to a different framing of the view. So he engages with Le Corbusier in a very heated uh, debate in the most uh, uh, read newspaper of, uh, of the time in Paris, where he accuses Le Corbusier that his architecture is not architecture at all. And very soon you realize in the argument that the focus of this critique is the horizontal window of Le Corbusier. It's because the horizontal window cuts precisely uh, the uh, foreground and the, and the background and leaves you only with the middle ground that the uh, wall has become like a picture sticking to your window without depth, to which he contrasts the idea of the standing man Right, with uh, his hands open in front of a poor fenet and having a perspectival view of the, of the wall. And there, in, I think in this argument in architecture, is this unbelievably interesting uh, transition between these uh, two worlds. So horizontality was extremely polemical and it was understood by all these, uh, uh, uh, these architects standing uh, precisely for a, a new um, uh, uh, uh, uh, subject uh, uh, position, uh, but also, of course, with a lot of uh, political uh, implications, which is what was lost precisely when modern architecture was imported in the United States as, a, as the international style. It was reduced to, to a style, etc. But I mean, I mean, it's very long, uh, uh, and elaborate uh, uh, discussion. But uh, but uh, it's, it's just to, I suppose, I'm. I'm uh, kind of uh, vindicating the place of architecture in this course, because, I mean, both architects and architectural historians tend to read architecture only in formalist uh, uh, uh, ways, and people outside of architecture tend to dismiss uh, architecture as a thinking and cultural uh, contribution, when, in fact, you can find it there as well, in the same way that you find it in film and, or in painting or in whatever other form of art, art production, uh, a cultural production. 
question? Anthony Gardner? You had a question. Yes, so my name is Anthony Gardner. I've got a range of questions. I might save some of them for later. Sorry, is this okay? Can people hear me? Yeah? Louder. Louder. Okay, so um, the two questions. Firstly, one for uh, Beatrice. And you talked about perhaps this neo-avant-garde becoming the, the sort of the inheritors of the historical avant-garde, which is a concept that's sort of a bit complicated in art history. It's sort of uh, an absorption, perhaps, of the communists within a capitalist system, perhaps. I guess one question I would have would be, has your research pulled you into other kinds of little magazines, such as Samizdat? Sorry, has your, has your research pulled you into uh, other magazines, such as Samizdat, from the same period? And if not, why not? Some is that, so. <laughs> so that's, that's fine, we'll, we'll stick with that one. Uh, uh, Oslo, it was uh, a number of uh, people uh, came uh, and I have uh, new contacts now with, uh, and we were talking about before with uh, Walter, some uh, Hungarian uh, dissident uh, publications, uh, some Soviet ones. In everything that has been done in this project uh, has been done this way, right? I mean, for example, now the exhibition is going to Latin America. It was asked by somebody in Chile. Uh, immediately, this person got in contact with other people in Argentina, in Brazil, in Mexico. Uh, is, is, these magazines don't, don't exist in libraries and archives. So the archives is normally with the, with the people. That's why the oral uh, history. So this group, for example, in... Uh, in um, uh, in Chile has organized a, a, a team, basically, of, uh, of people that are doing uh, research in uh, little magazines in, in, uh, in Latin America. They are uh, constantly, as we go to other places, as I, as I explained, the research uh, uh, continues. There are some leads into this and also some conversation about bringing the exhibition uh, to Moscow. Uh, and uh, I also saw, among other things, uh, uh, some uh, publications that were really funny because they, in, uh, in Moscow, for example, they were reproducing La Cidetur de Urdu, like, uh, how could you call that, bootleg uh, uh, copies of La Cidetur de Urdu and other little uh, magazines. So there are the dissident publications and also the publications of the former West that somehow were infiltrated into, into, into the Soviet Union and, and uh, repro reproduced in, in and I have some copies of, of them. So it's n in no way uh, uh, a finished uh, uh, uh, research, but I was, uh, as I say, I think, uh, before, and I don't think I, I mentioned the word neo avant-garde, but uh, uh, uh, I'm completely surprised by the extent and of, the, of the phenomena. Uh, in all parts of the of, of the world, and also political and different different things happen in different places. For example, we know we talk about a lot about uh, English magazines like Archigram; those are the best known, right? Influenced by uh, comic magazines, etc. No politics there. I mean, in like May 68 didn't happen in England, apparently, right? I mean, it's unbelievable. Now the French, the Italians, and the and the Spanish extremely politicized, right? Uh, magazines. Uh, Bernard Tumi from France offer AD to do a special issue of May 68 and uh, the revolution in the schools of architecture, etc. And that was done two years after 68. He was very happy, which, I mean, he was a very young architect, obviously, he was very happy with that. He offered them to do then another issue in what was happening in Ireland. And they said, oh, no, no, of course, no. I mean, May 68 in Paris, okay, but Ireland don't talk to us about. So in England, no politics, in other uh, parts of the world, uh, uh, uh, extremely political. So they are not equivalent, you know, they are not equivalent. These magazines, very, very different. Politic politics in Mexico, uh, politics in, in, uh, in, um, in Italy, 
so it's a kind of different geography. I'm not sure if I answer all your questions. It's okay, fine. I've just got a question for Jody Dean. Um, Jody, I really enjoyed. Sorry. Oh, there. Okay. Yeah. I really enjoyed your presentation. I found it incredibly engaging. Um, I found your battering of the neoliberal invisible hand ideology to be very fruitful, um, showing it correctly to be a kind of theology of limited horizons, to excuse the pun, of political agency. The difficulty is, I guess, that there's a kind of, or there seems to be a lack of heavyweight contemporary communist ideologies to kind of beat this, these horizons of um, limited political agency of the invisible hand discourse. Um, and I'm sort of wondering where these communist ideologues might be. I don't I don't know your work beyond this paper, but I would have said from this paper that you, despite your call for discipline, which is a nicely kind of almost reminiscent of Brechtian call, um, that you possibly don't fit this model of a communist ideologue because you don't present a kind of program of what this contemporary communism might be. Um, and in a sense, by your model, this almost leaves your discourse operating at the level of the drive rather than desire. Perhaps, maybe a challenge. Anyway, what I was wanted to ask is how might you see this contemporary communism dealing with um, some of the major issues on the political horizon at the moment, such as climate change and environmental politics, um, something which traditionally hasn't had a very good relationship with old school Marxism, um, and maybe even, though this is less important to me personally, religious conflict. Sorry, religious conflict. I'm more concerned about environmental politics, though. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't... I, the way I think about this right now is actually really inspired by... Um, <laughs> The, by Badu and Zizek's um, work over the last couple of years um, as opening up and pushing um, leftist theorists to start doing more of the work in this direction as opposed to the direction that, the left, that leftist theorists have gone in the last 20 or 30 years. So I think it's an open um, project right now, right? I think it's really open and I think that's a good thing. Um, I think that, um, so if you want to say this, I don't, I'm not sure, I wouldn't say it's at the level of the drive. I actually think that it's, um, at, I, but I, that, that's a really technical discussion, so I won't sort of discuss all that right now. Um, dealing with major issues, I actually think that a, um, a collective communist solution is going to be the only way to deal with something like climate change, that a market orientation is ludicrous, right? They can't be, um, Governments whose primary um, beneficiaries are corporations will never come to an agreement. And this little bitty minor negotiating over emissions here, emissions there, that's a fruitless path. So I think that, um, does that tell you the answer? No, but it does tell you that I think that a market-driven direction that we're going to keep seeing, this, actually the spinning of drive there, and that, some, that a much more collective, common um, approach, it, it, is going to be necessary. Is one there yet? I'm not sure. I mean, I have to, you know, do more work and reading on this. I think David Harvey's discussion in the Enigma of Capital is wonderful. In his last chapter, when he has a whole bunch of program, programmatic statements for what is to be done. Um, so I think um, I think that as in Saskia Sassen actually has um, a couple of statements about um, a pro that. A, um, a general approach that would emphasize primarily sustainability um, and housing actually become goals. So I think that there are um, that there is a there, there are prog programmatic approaches emerging. They're not quite systematic. Do they need to be? I'm not sure. It could be that um, 
I don't know, to, like to just use a stupid expression like open source communism wouldn't um, need that, but, but I don't know, right? So I think, I think that part of it is um, invigorating the idea, invigorating the possibility of, of thinking and writing under the term um, is a good one. And I think it's um, especially, you know, given the, the way that um, left theory has, has gone in the last 20 or 30 years, that it seems like an open possibility and something that's, that's really positive and exciting to me. Yeah. I'd like to briefly respond to your question, uh, very briefly. I think the fact that there isn't a um, set of ideological heavyweights configuring the, horror, the landscape of communism today is the most wonderful and positive thing, right? The 20th century was, was shackled, and the communism of the 20th century was shackled by its allegiance to false gods, right? The, a decadent state and a decadent party apparatus. We have to return, I think, to Marx's invocation of communism as a specter that you actually, that everyone talks about but nobody sees, right? Um, and I'm quite happy to, to, to, like you said, I mean, this constant invocation of communism by the right is, is very significant because it proves that it, it has returned to its spectral origins, um, which is a very good thing. And we don't, I mean, I, I very rarely use the word communist as a description of my ethic and my practice. I know it to be true, but it doesn't have to be named. Uh, and insofar as, let's say, global warming is concerned, it's extremely significant that any effort to think about global warming requires us to think at a planetary level, requires us to think beyond the questions of the extraction of surplus value, right? And that puts at center stage, at an international level, planetary thinking that is post-capitalist for which we have only one name, even if we don't have to say it. Hello. Yeah. So it's still for Shuda, it's not so much a question. Uh, but since you've already in your talk operated at this location of the, of the former West Horizon, both geographically and, and, and, and, um, and historically, I would just perhaps unfairly like uh, to, to, to invite you to reiterate uh, our, our conversation from last night, which was dislocating the, the 89 um, uh, moment um, in a, and, and the, and the, and the east-west divide on a, on a north-south or northern Mediterranean uh, divide and looking at the late 70s and early 80s um, evolutions and then also perhaps, well, to, depends how far you want to take the reiteration. Thank you. I mean, we did have, I, I, did, I had a generous glass of whiskey last night when we were having this conversation, so I'll try and recreate the, the, the, the chemical conditions. <clears throat> No, I, I am, I'm a bit concerned with this 89 fetish uh, because I think it is a fetish. Um, the, the, the, what, what we were talking about yesterday was that if you turn the calendar back just 10 years from 89, you come to a situation where like uh, dictatorships collapsed in Eastern Europe in 89, dictatorships collapsed in Southern and Western Europe in the years between 1976 to 82. And I'm thinking uh, Portugal, I'm thinking Spain, I'm thinking the incredible crises that wrecked Italy, for instance, in the years of lead and what followed thereafter. So this idea that the world changed in 89 and, and, and capitalist liberal democracy triumphed in 89 is, sig is signatory to the myopia of those who think so. Uh, the world changed just as much in 76, in 82. Uh, it changed just as much when, um, when uh, you know, 400 people were killed, massacred in, in Paris, 
uh, and remember, Algeria was never a colony of France. It needs to be absolutely understood Algeria was France. It was not a colony in the classic sense in which other uh, uh, colonies were colonies of metropoles. It, in that sense, the, the, the, uh, what happened with, the FLA, um, with, the, with, with Algeria and France changed France fundamentally. It changed Western Europe fundamentally. So um, we have to be a little, when there are many former Wests, not just the one that we can recover after 89. Um, so th that's just to displace the idea of, uh, of, uh, of this junction of, of, of time and space, which the term former West sort of uh, neatly um, parenthesizes. I don't know, th does that answer your question adequately? Right. Well, we, <laughs> we don't have the whiskey. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Angela, Angela Harutunyan. I have a slight uh, problem with this notion of uh, communism as a specter. Because uh, again, like this, this question of the, um, the, the impossibility. And in, in a way, um, this for me, the Bolshevik revolution as a singular historical instance was possible or became possible uh, precisely because um, there was a realization that this specter is really re very real. Um, and I'm also wondering, um, yeah, we are now here talking about theory, leftist theory, uh, but also there was this notion that there's no such thing as theory in practice, but there is praxis. And I'm wondering why um, the, uh, the contemporary left, be that the radical left or the mainstream left or the democratic left, is unable to offer an, a, a positive affirmative vision um, that will be followed by a large number of people. Why, let's say, the European working classes are more united uh, through anti-immigrant sentiments than through a struggle for social justice, for example. Or, uh, and, and this is a rhetorical question, is it because maybe the contemporary left treats the right not as politics, but as some sort of like irrational, almost religious force that, that is threatening, whereas, whereas the right threatens the left as, as politics. Thank you. Spectres are very real. Spectres are not unreal. I mean, I believe in ghosts. Uh, I think that they are present uh, amongst us. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not to be treated as figures that are yet to come. They're more in the nature of what exists between concrete instances. So that does not make them unreal. Uh, so I don't think of uh, a specter as something that, that we'll have to realize. It's here. I mean, the very fact that we are sitting, so many of us, in a, in a discussion on contemporary art and talking so much about communism means that it is actually real in, in our lives in a fundamental way. And don't forget that working class politics against immigration has always existed. It's not new. It was there in the 19th century. It was there in the riots against Irish and Hispanic and Italian and Jewish immigrants in America. It was there in France. It is what the First International actually acted against all the time, right? So this, this again, the delusion that the, the right has taken, that the working classes are no longer a site of struggle because they speak the language of the right, um, is, is, is a figure of our own amnesia. People have always spoken the language of the right, right? In fact, that's the reason why we have to speak the language that we speak, because they have always spoken that language. So, um, it, it, and it's very interesting that so much of this conversation actually takes place now within the framework of an aesthetic domain. And that, for me, is not its displacement, to, uh, to continue a conversation that began uh, yesterday, uh, but also its real site of operation. And I'll take a little time to elaborate why I think so. It's a talk I did very recently on aesthetics and emancipation. Plato banishes people who make things and artists 
outside the republic. They cannot be citizens, and there's a reason why he says they can't be citizens. It's because they're never going to have the time to think of the common, right? Because they're constantly making things, there's always things to be done, their work always waits, so they'll never have the time to actually lift themselves up to a situation where they can think of commons in society. I think the insistence, the reason why the aesthetic is the political today, and this is a sort of gloss of Jacques Rancière's idea of the distribution of the sensible, is because of the fact that in order for people like ourselves, people who make things, people who make the world, to reassert our control over time, time not as in present and past, but time as in the duration of our life, and to say, because we don't have the time, we need to actually, that is what entails us to, an, to, to a position from which we can think about the commons, right? So the reason why the, why the arts are absolutely the site of um, politics today is because we are thinking about space, time, experience, duration, um, inhabitation in a way that we have never done before, right? And that's why it's not, and this is a very important distinction, we are not artists who work about the political. That was a previous generation where artists saw themselves in the service of the political as, as, protag as sort of propagandists of activist agendas. I am by and large quite irritated by activist art because I think it is not political enough, right? I think art is the site where we rethink the political, rethink our understandings of space, time, and inhabitation and the body, and that is why it is political. That's why we're having this conversation here. Sarah Wilson from the, is this working? Uh, yes, Sarah Wilson from the Courtauld Institute again. Um, before communism was invented, the Marquis de Sade was the antithesis to Rousseau. And I just want to say that power is expressed all over the world, actually, power and domination in the most horrible way in vertical skyscrapers and not in networks. So um, I was really fascinated and more than fascinated, deeply intellectually engaged in the interventions of this morning. But they are all, um, you know, they all exclude the evil factor, the evil factor that is the common stuff of all the blockbuster films, of all the computer games, of everything you want to play. And there seems to me a kind of consensus of goodwill and desire and horizons of expectation going on that do not involve, even in terms of discussions of ecology, the fact that many, many, many millions of people in the world might, in theory, have the right to the refrigerators that we all enjoy. So I think that there's a very, especially when you're discussing social inequality or even social inequality in Istanbul, there is a horrible, which I'm not capable of theorizing or solving, pragmatic element, which relates to the vertical. Maybe these factors of thinking about verticality versus horizontality are more useful in a networked world than thinking of um, right versus left, which was an old French invention. But I, I do think that there, and also, of course, the idea of, of the um, revolution was taking the eschatological horizon, it was secularizing from religious structures in the first place. So I do think that there's a big problem that is not being discussed here, which is, if you like, the specter of verticality. Oops. May I? Uh, so this is Ekaterina Degat. Uh, so I have a question to Judy, which might be very stupid. Um, I have the impression uh, for a long time already that the dissolution of um, historical communism came as a blessing or 
also for, for the left, uh, because it, it gave a possibility to restore this communism as a horizon, and which wouldn't be blocked by the uh, you know, dirty reality of uh, real uh, Soviet Union. That's why I have a very simple question. Uh, how do you place this uh, Soviet Union project? Was it wrong from the beginning? Did it went wrong at some point? And if yes, then at which one? Or was it right uh, through the end? I, um, I, I agree with you completely that the dissolution of historical communism is a wonderful opening, and that's um, a blessing um, for the left. Um, I mean, there, you know, as as you know, and as uh, um, there's a long debate about um, with multiple layers and positions on when did the um, Soviet Union go wrong. And I think that, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think I want to, um, you know, get into that um, argument. I will, I, what I want to say, though, is that I think that all the way through, there um, were folks who thought that the communist project was a valuable one and that during the worst parts of, of Stalinism and the most stagnant parts of the Brezhnev years, there were still people who raised criticisms through the ideals of communism rather than from a West, so-called Western capitalist um, liberal democratic perspective. And that one of the things that's important in learning from the Soviet experience is learning from those voices, is you know, um, you know, reading them, I mean, from, you know, for, from some of us um, like me, it would be for having them translated into English, but for even knowing about them. So I think there's so much um, learning from the experience that hasn't been done that was just foreclosed so quickly after um, 1989. And so, um, so I think a better, I actually think, I'm, I mean, I'm not, because I'm not a historian, I don't know, but my best guess is that there's not going to be one answer or one good answer to when that the project go, um, when did it go wrong? There are always there are always um, you know breaks and moments where this decision was not a great one. This one went in a bad way, but you know would it have been different if they'd gone another way? I mean, it's a, that's always a kind of that kind of backward glance is I I think is a hard one. Um, there. It's one more comment and one question. Uh, a comment to, or maybe a reaction, what is happening because communism is in this space, as you said. Um, what a reaction to, an example after the presentation of Beatrice. Uh, I feel myself reminded to practices that I have been involved in the 1990s uh, in several levels. I mean, on the one hand, how graphic design played a role to invent, you know, new formats of expression of small publications, of self-publications, of self-articulation. Uh, that is now what I see in the institutionalization of this uh, practices also erased. You know, you don't find really inventive graphic design anymore. You know, also on that kind of level, there is even no big T or any kind of copy aesthetics. There is nothing really invented on this kind of aesthetic level. You know, I think there is also a big problem. Yeah? So everything is now in good fonts. It is always, I mean, readable. You know, there is nothing experimental about it. Then there is something else I'm reminded for. Uh, that there was no division between music, theater, literature, and so on. You know, so that there is a practice where culture is not divided in the visual arts and its uh, different formats and attention markets, but that there is kind of a flow of interest and community that, uh, or something that you have in common, actually, what you share that makes this other aesthetic paradigm. So this reminds me, and for me this is empowering, I have to say. Again, because it reminds me that I could step in again, this kind of practice, you know? That it is not lost, that uh, it is also uh, valuable to invest these nights without being paid, you know? To publish this. <laughs> so I think it is there's something of a commonism, 
uh, that creates uh, if, you, uh, if you are showing us this kind of practice. It's not just only your own practice, like doing the exhibition and opening up it for discussion and creating, I mean, a research base, but it's also doing something for us as the audi audience. Mm -hmm. And that also relates to the question, uh, second question, because you made a division between co the common and the commons. And I have to say that I di didn't really get the argument, and I think it would be very important for us all to, pres uh, to make it more precise, because I think there may be a, not a program, but a more theoretical and then also practical perspective on what is to be done uh, could be elaborated. Um, so do you want me to try to um, explain it? Okay. So it's not, the distinction comes from Cesare Casarino. Um, and, it, and the common, in his way of thinking about it, refers primarily to um, things like language, culture, affect, affectivity, um, communication. Um, and what is, it is for him, ideas, thought, all of this is common in that none of it can ever appear or be in any singular fashion. Um, and so to that extent, it's characterized by um, infinitude, lack of limits. Um, commons would be something like, you know, the old, um, what was enclosed um, in England, right, the past years, like we would say water would be a commons, um, air would be a commons, because it is a limit, it is limited. Um, and we have to figure out ways, um, it's be characterized by conditions of scarcity. So one's characterized by conditions of abundance, and one's characterized by conditions of scarcity. Now, my complication of this is to say that the abundant can also be a vehicle for expropriation because of the way that one, and I try to use this network idea, the way that the energies of everyone, the creativity of everyone can be stimulated and incited to produce the one who is going to be monetized and you know held up and um, like the you know the hero or the celebrity. So if you think about it with respect to um, blogs, I'm a blogger. Um, there's uh, I don't know uncountable blogs are uncountable. They're always you know emerging and, and going away. So there are hundreds of millions of blogs. Um, the vast majority of them get almost no hits. They don't last very long. A few become. Um, very, very profitable ventures, and their writers become then you know, media people, like pundits, or they publish books, or um, they become some kind of important figures. Now, one of the interesting things that, about this is that all of this proliferating activity of the many is generally uncompensated, yet it enables the acquisition of enormous wealth by the few. So I think this is a different kind of explo ex exploitation than we saw under a situation completely of scarcity. And so to my mind, it, it's a way of trying to theorize exploitation under conditions of communi communicative capitalism. So that abundance is not, only, is not simply this kind of Deleuzian you know, greatness of everything's fabulous. And like I, I think there's some differences on um, our views on, on, on these things. About this kind of, there are kinds of communicative abundance that have exploitative effects. And so that, that's what that difference is doing um, for me. Does that help? Okay. I'll exercise my moderator's privilege and say that it's time to break for lunch. Yes. Thank you very much.